it's a great thing to witness when God gives talents to his people. Especially when from a young age, they're able to use that talent to worship God, isn't it? Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful music. Well, well this is the second week of the series, Let God. If you were not here last week, um, you can watch it on the video, you can listen to the podcast. But we're in this series where we are trying to learn how to let God be part of every area of our life. And today I want to start by showing you some pictures of celebrities. So I gave you already a hint of who they are. And your task is to see, we're going to find out if you know who these people are. Are you ready? Okay, the first one is, uh, you knew that Gene, you knew that one. See, for those of you way younger... Maybe like me, uh, Frank Sinatra was the Justin Bieber of the 50s. So, um, celebrity. Uh, this is another one. Are you ready? This is Fernando Valenzuela, a pitcher for the Dodgers. He's a World Series champion from 1981. And he happened to be Mexican. Um, are you ready for the third one? Okay, you, you seem to know who this person is. Good, good. Michelle Obama, the former president's wife. Now, let me see if you know this one. I think everybody knows this one. Bugs Bunny, right? Now... There's an interesting thing about celebrities, because it doesn't matter from what generation they are, it doesn't matter what they did, what they're known for, is that we as normal folk, we know who they are. We know things about them. We know what they did, who they did it with, if they belong to a team when they did it, how they did it. We know about their family. We know about the place of their birth. We know about all kinds of things. In fact, we even know about how much money they made. Because it is a thing about us as people trying to find out and know information about other people. We like to know things about other people, especially if they're famous. But we really don't like people knowing about us. In fact, nowadays we have this thing, we call it protection. But we, somebody calls us, may I speak to Mr. Pacini? Who's this? We want to know who's calling. We want to know where they're calling for. We want to know what they want to know before we give them any kind of information because we are afraid to give information out. Now, let me scare you a little bit. Did you know that there's somebody who knows everything about you? In fact, he knows more about you than you know about yourself. The thing is that oftentimes we forget that there is someone who cares so much about you that knows things about you that you don't even know about yourself yet. And, and this is the thing. See, I believe that God is interested in you to know about you because He wants to make a difference in your life. One of the things that we forget about God is that God is omnipresent. You know what that means? He's everywhere. At the same time. And see, that's kind of freaky. That's kind of spooky for us because we don't really understand that. We are constrained by physics and space. And we don't understand how someone can be here and there at the same time. But God is. Another thing that we forget about God is that God has of me power. That means that he can do everything, everything. Things that 
He wants to do and things that He doesn't want to do. He can do everything. Things that you want to happen in your life and things that you don't want happening in your life, God can do everything. But the one area of God that is important to us today is that God possesses of me science. And this is that God knows everything. Everything that happens in history, everything that happens in the future, and everything that happens in the present. If you take your notes out, they're in your bulletin. Read with me what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Jared read it beautifully this morning for the Bible text. Um, Hebrews 4 verse 13. And it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight. Whose sight is this? God's. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, this is one of those texts that mothers use on children to make them tell the truth. But in reality, it tells us more. It tells us more about God. See, he's not interested in knowing things about you only. God is interested in knowing you. Are you with me? See, we know information about people, about celebrities, about famous people. We know information about them. But see, even if you can tell me the name of the children of Michelle Obama, can you tell me their names? You know their names. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever shaken their hand? Have you ever had a lunch with them? Have you ever had a conversation with them? See, you know things about them, but you don't know them. One thing is to know things about a person, and another thing is to know the person. What God is willing to do in His most deepest desire is not to know things about you, is to get to know you. But there's one thing about relationships. Relationships only work when two people are willing Have you ever had that call, well, or that conversation? Well, I like you, but as a friend? Don't lie, you have. But the thing is that it doesn't even work as a friendship because you're already thinking something else. And that relationship can only work if two people are willing. The same thing happens with God. God is willing to get to know you. But the truth is that that relationship can only work if you are willing. So today, the goal is to understand not only how much God knows about you, but how, mo how much He wants to have a relationship with you. So to... to, to dive into this conversation. There's some elements that we need to know about the scope of the knowledge of God about us. And the first thing we need to understand is that God knows all my faults and failures. God knows all my faults and failures. Psalm 69 5 says, Oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Now, this is bad news because God knows everything bad that we've ever done. God knows everything. Sometimes you want to forget that God has omniscience because there's some things in our life that we don't God, we don't want God to know. We want Him to remain secret from Him. We don't want Him to open that door. We don't want Him to get that information. Unfortunately, it makes us uncomfortable, the realization that there's nothing that we can hide from Him. He knows it all. Sometimes we just wish that He just didn't know of us. And we can think of one or two things, at least, that we wish that God would not know about us. 
But the truth is that it's foolish to try to hide our sins. Proverbs 5.21 says, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The, the, the Good News translation says, For the ways of man are in full view. When I read this text in that version, it opened my mind to think of reality TV. I don't know why. I don't even watch it, but it opened my mind to reality TV. The only thing I know about reality TV is that there's cameras everywhere. That every conversation, eh, I don't know how real it is, but at least you see them in the house, you see them in the car, you see them everywhere. There's cameras everywhere. I don't know how God does it. But He sees everything. Our life is in full view. And this is exactly what we oftentimes struggle to understand. Because when we are tempted to sin, we have this conversation. In fact, we don't even realize that we have a conversation, but the truth is that we have a conversation. And the other individual that we have the conversation with is not God. In reality, it's the devil. And this is how the conversation goes. If you do it, nobody will know. There's no way anybody will find out. You're only going to do it once. And if it just happened that in that moment you were a little bit weak, you were not truly connected, you fall. And now you have a second conversation. And the conversation goes a little bit different. Because now the dialogue goes something like this. I did it. What if they find out? You know how we call that? Guilt. The devil, his plan is not just to make you sin. Because he knows we have an antidote for sin. We have the atonement of Jesus Christ. But see, what the devil wants is not for us just to sin. What the devil wants from us is to feel guilty about our sin. Because nobody who is guilty, who feels guilty, as we talked about last week, enjoys life. And guilt oftentimes is what prevents us from confessing. Because somehow we're masochists deep inside and we like to feel guilty. So that's the kind of conversation that we have. Unfortunately, there's somebody who already knows. And that is God. He already knows what we did. He already knows what happened. He already knew about our conversation. So there's a fact we need to understand. And the fact is this. God is not shocked by my sin. God never says, no way. I never thought you would be able to do that. See, God never says that. Instead, God says, I understand. I see how that could have happened. Because God already knows me better than I know myself. Now, our response, family, is that we have to learn to be honest. Honest with ourselves and honest with God. He knows everything, so we have to stop. We have to stop pretending that God doesn't know. Our problem is that we pretend that God is never going to find out, that God does not know. But family, I tell you, He already knows. We have to stop pretending. I always say that there's something magical happening when we enter the church's parking lot. Because we could, have, we could be in the middle of the worst fight with our family in the car. But as soon as we get into the church, happy Sabbath. We have to stop. Stop pretending. God already knows. And He is the most important person in the universe to know. And He already knows. 
And the beautiful thing about this is that even though he knows all my sins and failures, he still loves me. Because he already knows me. The second thing, family, that we need to understand about God's knowledge is that God knows all my feelings and frustrations. And yes, this is the time when you get to vent. At least in silence. Psalm 31, 7 says, I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy, for you have considered my trouble. You have known my soul in adversities. Now this is kind of cool because you might think, well, nobody really understands my pain. Nobody's going through what I'm going through. Nobody understands me. If they only knew what I'm going through, see, like I said before, we have a degree of masochism in ourselves. We enjoy our pain. We enjoy to suffer a little bit. You know, I don't know if you ever did it. Did you ever press? This is what we used to do when we were kids. I don't know if you did it, but at least I did. I don't know. Weird childhood. You ever pressed on your nail for a while? Like this? Do it. Do it right now. Do it. In case you didn't do it. Let me give you a little bit of childhood here. Press, yeah, yeah, just press on your nail above and below the, 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 the thumb, okay, do it, just a little bit, just a little bit, all right, do, don't, don't sever your finger, just a little bit, yeah, now go like this, press up on your, t how do you feel? It feels good? It should hurt. Now, if you do this for a long time and then you press on your thumb up, there's a pain that comes in. Now, why do we do this when we were kids? I don't understand it, but we like that pain. And see, because we are like that since we're little, when we are adults, we enjoy different kinds of pain. We like to have, in fact, we're proud of our pain sometimes. Oh, I'm going through this. You need help? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I, I have a headache. What, you want to take something? No, no, I'm good. It'll go. It'll go away. Why don't you go to the doctor? No, no, no. It always happens to me. It goes away a little bit. We are like that. We enjoy our pain. But you know what, family? God already knows our pains and frustrations. Oftentimes we think like this, like, like, like the psalmist in Psalm 56, 6. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps. He's talking about people who are chasing him. This is David when he's in the, in, in the mountains being chased by Saul. And when they lie in wait for me, in reality he's saying, they're all against me. I'm alone. And that's how we like to feel sometimes. And we like to tell people, oh, I'm going through this. You need help? No, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm just letting you know what I'm going through. You know, we think that is a, a, a patch in our Pathfinder sash. You know. Pain 2017, October. But family, the reality is that there is no tear that escapes God's eye. He understands exactly, he understands exactly what you're going through. If you're going through a loss, God's, God understands loss. If you're going through physical pain, God understands physical pain. If you're going through a broken relationship, God understands broken relationships. Whatever pain you're going through, God understands it. He knows every heart. He knows every circumstance. He knows every issue in your life. And not only that, He understands what you're going through. He knows exactly what you need in this particular moment. Maybe today all you feel is that you are frustrated because of the pain that you've been carrying for a long time and you got so used to it you don't even know what to do. The psalmist also read, uh, wrote this. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. I don't know if it happened to you, but I, I guess it happens more with the first child. I don't know, maybe because I have three, but don't tell the other two. When you have your first child, you buy every, every safety device in existence. 
You pad the corners of the table. You buy the latches for the drawers. You make sure that the house is childproof. When we had our first child, if the, the organization from the government that checks the houses are going to be used for child caring for professionals, my house would have passed with flying colors. Because we had everything. But you know what? It got old. All the things started getting ripped and broken. By the time the second child arrived, some of those things didn't work. But at least we childproofed it once. <laughs> because see, when they went, by the third one came, you know, by the time he came. <laughs> uh, this is what happens. You see your child, your first child, you see him walking, right? He's taking the first steps and you're right behind. You're right behind. And the other parent is like this. Come on. Come on. It, come on. You know, you, you're ready to catch him. You, uh, the first sign that they're losing their balance, you just dive and, and try to catch him. Like it was the ball in the World Series for the ninth out and the ninth in. Uh, but see, this is what happens. As you get used to it, you know, the third one falls. You're like, just get up. <laughs> you know, just get up. Uh, it's okay. Shake it off. Rub some dirt on it. You know, but see, I, I think that God, God, the way he sees us, like a father, he, he cares for us as we, as if we were his only child. He takes care of us in an incredible way, in such a way that we, we don't even understand. And you know when you are that child, because I am that child, the only child. You know that. You know that. If you were the only or the first one, you know that care. And there's a moment that when you want to say, I got this. I got this. I know what to do. You know, when you teach your son how to drive, do this, do that. Oh, I know, I know, but you're not. Stop. I know, I know. We're just like that with God. God is telling us, you know, do, do this. This is what I want for your life. I got it. I know, I know, and pfft, there we go, crash, there we go. But God is still there. He is still following us. He is still caring for us. He is still losing his sleep because any time that little monitor goes, shh, shh, wakes up to see how is his baby doing because God is like that father. God is sympathetic to our hurts. In such a way that he sees and cares as if each one of us were his only child. Our response to that is just to give in to our hurts. Stop trying to play it off. In fact, stop complaining about it. Just tell God, God, this is what I'm going through. Show me what I need to do. Show me what I need to accept. Show me what I need to understand. Another thing that, that we need to understand about the knowledge of God about us is that He knows our future. And this is quite interesting. I, I enjoy reading about this. Because see, we are, all of us, all of us, we are fascinated with knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. That is why I think we created the, the horoscope and the weatherman. Because we want to know what is going to happen tomorrow. Do you remember? This is not long ago when the weatherman only went a week. Now it's 10 days. And if you have a phone, it goes more than 10 days. You know, it's crazy. We like to know things that would happen in the future. That's why we have projections when we have elections. We like to know who won the election before it starts. And then, oh, what a surprise. But let's not get into that. Um, Psalm 139.16 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when... As yet, there were none of them. Let me translate that. God knew exactly what was going to happen every day of your life 
before you were born. Now let me explain a little bit about this. Because oftentimes we get the idea that because God knows the future already, there's nothing I can do to change that. It's already set. But no. We have a power, an ability that makes us unique and gives us even more assurance that we are God's children. And that is the freedom of choice, the freedom of decision. We get to choose and make decisions all the time. And this is how God sees it. God knows our future. God sees our future in two ways. He sees our future when we choose to follow His leads. And He sees our future when we choose not to. So this is what happens. Every time, and listen carefully, because if you're going to be away for a, for a minute, this is a minute. God allows us to make decisions, and every time we are going to make a decision, God sees what would be of us if we choose correctly or if we choose incorrectly. And every time we make that decision, the result will either get us closer to God or takes us farther away from Him. And every time we have to make a choice, our relationship with God is at stake. The reason why this happens is the same reason why God allowed Adam and Eve to make a decision about the tree that was in the middle of the garden. You remember the story? When I was a kid, and it perhaps happened to some of you, I would hear the story and, and I would think, man, if I had been Adam, I would never eat from that tree. Have you ever said that? But we do it every day in the decisions that we make. It's exactly the same decision. Except ours aren't written in the Bible. But we choose either to get closer to God or to get farther away from Him in every decision that we make. So He is saying... Guys, I know your future. If you would only pay attention a little bit to what I'm trying to tell you, your decisions will be better. Your choices will be according to my will, to the plan that I have for you. What is the plan that God has for us? Jeremiah 29, 11. I know you know it by memory, just like you memorized the text from last week that I gave you in the cards. Sinners. For, for I know the thoughts... Says Jeremiah, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a what? And a what? To give you a future and a hope. Why? Why do, as parents, why do we work so hard to give our children what? Are you breathing? God is giving us that. God is offering us a future and a hope. All we have to do is to pay attention. To pay attention to how much He wants to know us. The fact is that God knows my tomorrow today. What would my response be today? Ask for advice. For advice. If he already knows, ask for advice. Now, we are funny creatures, especially we, when we are trying to do God's will. Because there's different, different categories of our understanding of the wisdom of God and how much we want to do His will. For example, there are some of us who only ask God things when we're in trouble. Not some of us, right? We have a, a, an accident, we have a financial situation, we have a, a, a health issue in the family, that's when we pray. Right? Being honest, some of us, that's the moment when we pray. That's the moment when we fill out the card and we ask the church to pray and, you know, that's the moment. Some of us go the other extreme. Some of us, we wake up in the morning worried, God, should I wear the blue jeans or the black jeans? I want to do your will, please which jeans should I wear today? Right? There, there's some of us. But the thing is that God really doesn't care what color your jeans are. 
That's not part of his will. If you want to wear jeans or dockers, it doesn't matter to him. That's not in the spiritual matter. What God wants from us is that when every time we're going to make a decision that will affect relationships. What did I say? Affect relationships with him and with others. That is the moment that we ask for his wisdom. The moment that we're going to make a decision that will affect other people, we ask for his wisdom. The moment that we're going to make a decision that will get us closer or farther away from him, we ask his wisdom. Because that's when he's saying, guys, I know your future. I know what I want from you. My response is, lead me. Give me your advice. Not on what is the... What kind of, a, of veggie meat should I buy to honor God? No, no, no. He's not interested in that. He's interested on how I treat other people. He's interested on in my relationship with the people he surrounded me with to be his, his witness. Because God knows already my future. But also God already knows all my fears. Because we all have fears, different kinds. The most common nowadays is financial fear. We want to know exactly what to do at what time and who to do it with. Because we fear. We think that our future is 100% connected to my finances. That's what our culture tells us. But let me tell you something. I just read a few months ago, and this, this just opened my eyes. We always ask for a little bit more, right? People were asked, and, th and this is a, a Forbes uh, magazine uh, article. Uh, people were asked in different stratas of the, of the economic ladder, were asked, if you were to make more money, how much more do you need to be happy? And, and everybody in all stratas, millionaires and, and billionaires and, and people making the minimum, they all say the same thing. Just a little bit more. So that led me to another piece of investigation. Did you know that 98% of people who win the lottery within three years end up bankrupt? Interesting. Why is it that people who just didn't get a little bit more, they got a lot more, end up worse than when they started within three years? Let me tell you something, family. And this is just for us to understand how God sees the future. Money does not change anybody. More money does not change anybody. Repeat with me. Money does not change anybody. It just highlights who a person is. It just highlights. See, if somebody who was horrible with finances gets a lot of money, he will continue to be horrible. Somebody who was not given when they have a little bit, when they have a lot, will not give. Somebody who was frugal when they have a little bit, when they get a lot, they will be frugal. Money just highlights who a person is, does not change them. That's why people who got the, the lottery prize, they lost it right away because they didn't know. And see, this is what happens to us. We, will, we want God to bless us abundantly right away. Give me the blessings. I claim all the blessings in the Bible, all the promises, right? I've heard prayers like that, and I'm like, really? Are you willing to give your firstborn child? You know, we ask for things that we are not ready to receive because we are not following the advice that God has for our future. Are you with me?
God will give you what you are ready to receive. How do you know you're ready to receive it? To receive it because you are seeking His will. But if you're not seeking His will, He's not going to be ready to give you all the blessings that you could receive if you were. Now, Matthew 6, 31, 32 says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, that you need all these things. See, God already knows what we need. He already knows our situation. He understands what our fears and, and what our problems are. But worry, family, worry is caused by ignoring or forgetting or not knowing that God knows everything. Fear is caused by ignoring the omniscience of God. Because when I understand that God knows everything, He knows my situation. He knows how my business is doing. He knows how my wallet is doing. He knows how my health is. He knows how my family is. Now, verse 8, it says, Therefore, do not be like them. He's referring to those who are not seeking God's will. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. God knows all that even before we ask Him. So what He's saying here, what Jesus is saying is, seek the kingdom of God first, and all these things will be added unto you. Our problem is that we seek the things without the kingdom. fact, God is aware of all my needs. Now, I know we talked about prayer for a good seven weeks a few months ago, but I have to remind you of this. Oftentimes, when I observe the frame of my life and I find all my needs I come to God and I tell Him all my problems. In fact, there's a couple of songs written with those lyrics. Tell God all your problems. But see, the truth is, and what the Bible teaches me, is that prayer is not about information to God. See, God already knows. See, I'm not His reporter on earth. This is Rogelio Pacini reporting from West Covina. God, this is what's going on. No, He already knows. He already knows what is going on. Prayer, family. Prayer is not designed to provide information to God. Prayer is designed to seek answers. To find answers. But there is a real and true and great reason why we don't pray seeking answers. It's a lot easier for us to give information to God on things that He already knows. Because giving information is not a commitment. But if I pray, God, I need you to guide me. I need your answers. I am committing to whatever God is telling me I have to do. That is one of the reasons why we don't pray. We don't pray for answers. We pray with information, but we don't want answers. Because God giving me an answer means that I have to get up and do it. That is a commitment. That oftentimes we're not ready to do. So, knowing that God knows, my response is accept that God already knows my situation. Not to panic, but be brave to accept His answer. And the final thing that I want to share with you. Yes, I said it. The final thing. Is that God knows my faith. Every time that I do right, every time that I choose well, every time that I do something good, God already knows. 
Matthew 6, 1 and 4 says, Take heed that you do not do your terrible deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. That your terrible deeds may be, seen, may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret him, will himself reward you openly. The fact is this. Before they, before they catch the runner, look at me. Look at me. The fact is this. I even lost track of it. <laughs> every deed, every deed has... Okay, everybody? Every deed has every word. Now, every deed means that good deeds and bad deeds. But we're talking about the good things being rewarded. But this is what happened. See, not everything that is well, that is done well, not everything that is a good deed was meant to be well. Let me explain. Oftentimes, oftentimes, things that we do good, that we do for somebody else in our heart, we don't do it for them, we do it for us. Because you know what? It feels good to do good. It feels good. It feels good to visit. It feels good to feed somebody. It feels good to make a basket for them. It feels good. We are designed to do things for others. The problem is when we get addicted to the feeling good. Because now I want to do this. But I want to do it for me. I want to do it so, so they can take a picture and put our picture of our church in the recorder. The motives change. And God sees all that. God sees all that. But there's hope. There's hope. Because see, you've been in that recital, right? You had your children in piano or any instrument. Piano recitals are so interesting. Because there's all kinds of levels of talent. That's the fact. Not, every and not everybody is going to be a concert pianist. And you see the teacher presenting every child. And usually they begin with the little ones. But there's some little ones who practice, some little ones who are good. You know, but, but there's always the one that plays a song that is just one finger at a time. At the end, it's usually the, the really good ones, the older ones, the ones that, you know, the, the the, the structure that the, the teacher is proud of, the ones that showcasing, hey, your child could become like this one if you come to me. But half of it is the talent of the child and the other is the drive of the parents making them practice. I'm not taking anything away from the teacher. That is important. I had a piano teacher once and I came back from a bubble practice and my finger was jammed. And my piano teacher told me, well, you have to choose piano or volleyball later. You don't tell that to a teenage boy. But regardless of who the child is playing the piano, especially now, you know who, who, what child belongs to what parent. Because when that child is playing, even if it's just Mary had a little lamb, the parents get up, they get their phones, their cameras, or their iPads, and they block everybody. But you know what? They don't care because the one that's playing is their child. It doesn't matter if it's just one note at a time. It doesn't matter how many mistakes they make. They got it on film because they're proud that the one that's playing the piano is their child. You know, family, God is just like that. Every time you do something, every time you speak, every time you make a choice, God is looking and He's, look, that's my son, that's my daughter. Wait, don't distract me. Don't distract me. My son is doing something. My daughter is doing something. And I don't want to miss a moment. Because you know how it is, how beautiful it is to go back in your phone or in your computer and you see those old videos and bring memories. God is saying, you know, that's why, that's why I love you. I don't care how many mistakes you make. 
I don't care how many situations you're going through. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what, how your finances are. You are my child and, and my, all my attention is on you. All my focus, all my love is on you because I give everything. I give the universe for you. I died for you. I'll never forget that we have a father who is so interested in your life. So interested in every detail of your life. Not only he knows everything, but he's searching. He's longing for that relationship with you. In such a way that your thoughts become his thoughts. That your words become his words. That your deeds become his. But it can only happen. It can only happen when we let God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so amazed of your limitless, limitless knowledge of, of, our, of our lives. We are so amazed of your power and, and, and your interest in our lives. And Father, so many times we just didn't realize that, that you were there. Oftentimes we didn't care if you were there. Oftentimes we wish that you were not there. But Father, today, those of us who realize that you are more interested in us than we've ever been on you, we hope that, that our eyes could be open to the reality that we have a God that we cannot hide from. And that you're not there to judge us, you are there for us. And Father, I pray that when we leave this place, we can leave with the assurance that there is a God in heaven who is so invested in my life that there's nothing I can do but to respond, dedicating my life for you. And Father, we thank you because there is nothing we could do to be better loved by you or to make you love us less because you love us all the same. In Jesus Christ, we thank you.